Howdy, I'm the Amateur Logician. You can visit my website, by the way, at amateurlogician.com. This is a video on predicate logic. In particular, it's an introduction to existential instantiation and generalization. By the way, this is not part of the Substance Hill textbook. Nevertheless, it's an important topic to dive into. So let's do that right now. The previous video dealt with the universal quantifier. In this video, we're dealing with the existential quantifier. On the one hand, we have the existential instantiation argument, and on the other hand, we have the existential generalization argument. Let's look at our first argument. We have the major premise. There exists some x such that x is an f, and then we conclude that therefore a is an f. Now, it's very important to note that a is a so-called free variable. That is to say, it appears nowhere earlier in the given proof that we constructed. Whatever the thing is, we'll call it A, even though we don't necessarily know its specific identity. And then we have our existential generalization. We start with the major premise that A is an F, and then we conclude that there exists some X such that X is an F. For example, let's consider the argument, this tree is green, and then we conclude that, therefore, something is green. This would be an existential generalization. We've added a quantifier, something, or for some. There exists some x such that x is green. Whereas instantiation, we might have something is green, Therefore, we'll say A is green. And A is a free variable. We don't know exactly what it is necessarily. We just know there's something out there that is green. After all, our major premise says there's something's green, so we'll just say A, whatever A happens to be, is green. With this existential instantiation, we start with a quantifier, the existential quantifier, and we remove the quantifier. We have a free variable. It's very important that it appears nowhere earlier in our proof. With existential generalization, we add a quantifier. We add that sum, that there exists some x such that x is an f. All right, we will work on four examples. I wrote a little note on the screen because I thought it was particularly important to emphasize. I write. Generally speaking, when constructing a proof in predicate logic, the more difficult part is with propositional logic, not predicate logic. When we make our proof in predicate logic, we typically, not always, but typically, remove the quantifiers. That's step one. Then we deal with the rules of inference in propositional logic. That's step two. And then, if necessary, we add quantifiers. That's step three. We need to keep this in mind when we do predicate logic. Example one, premise one, we're told that all philosophers are logicians. We have universal quantification here for all x. If x is a philosopher, then x is a logician. Premise two, some philosophers are rationalists. This has existential quantification. There exists some x where x is a philosopher and x is a rationalist. Conclusion, therefore, some logicians are rationalists. There exists some x where x is a logician and x is a rationalist. Intuitively, this argument makes sense. And we can intuitively see this through a Venn diagram. I want to briefly show this. We'll say this circle represents philosophers. The circle represents logicians, and the circle represents rationalists. The first premise deals with philosophers and logicians. So in, with that premise, we will only consider the circle of philosophers and the circle of logicians. We're told that all philosophers are logicians. So there's a sense in which we can erase this part of the circle of philosophers because 
there is no philosopher outside the circle of logicians because all philosophers are logicians. With the second premise, we're told that some philosophers are rationalists. So here we have to consider the circle of philosophers and the circle of rationalists, but also we have to keep in mind that we erased, so to speak, some of that circle of philosophers. So if we're going to place our X, it'll be right here. Some philosophers are rationalists. But because that X appears in a circle of logicians, it must be the case that some logicians are rationalists. The conclusion validly follows. And we can intuitively picture this with our diagram. Now, let's prove it with predicate logic by following this general guideline, the three steps. The first thing we want to do is remove our quantifiers. But before we do that, let's consider the conclusion. We have an existential conclusion. This means that when we instantiate our premises, we're going to want to instantiate constants, not a variable that can represent anything whatsoever. Okay. Strategically, it makes most sense to work on the second premise first. For line three, let's instantiate the constant A, which is a free variable in the sense that we have not used that variable yet. Okay, so we'll say P A and R A. We just substitute, so to speak, A for that variable X. So this is existential um, instantiation from line two. And now we can work on the first premise. It deals with everything. X can be anything whatsoever. So it therefore follows that we can substitute A for X. So we'll say P A arrow L A by the universal instantiation of line one. By the way, the previous video, we went over universal instantiation and universal generalization. So we substitute A for that variable X. Moreover, we really had to substitute A for X. Okay. It's the only way we can relate lines three and four. Now notice that we have PA on line three, and PA appears in the antecedent of a conditional. So for line five, let's get PA by the simplification of line three. And then for six, we can get LA by modus ponens with lines four and five. We have LA. If we look at our conclusion, we have LX. We're halfway there. We need RA. So for line seven, We'll use a commutative rule to get RA and PA. So this is the commutative rule with line three. A lot of textbooks, you can only simplify with this first term of a conjunction, not the second. So it's tedious, but we have to use a commutative rule according to many, many textbooks. But the Substance Hill textbook actually allows you to simplify with the first or the second term, which is nice, and you don't have to do that tedious operation of, of the commutative rule. So for eight, we can get that uh, we can get that RA then by the simplification of seven. For nine, we can use our conjunction rule. So we'll get LA and RA by the conjunction rule with line six and eight. And now, because a is a something, there's an A, that's an L, and an R, we can say there is something, there is some X such that X is an L and X is an R. So therefore, it is the case that there's some X where X is an L and X is an R. And this is the existential generalization from line nine. So we proved our conclusion. Notice, of course, that the first thing we did was to remove the quantifiers and then we use the standard rules of propositional logic, and then finally we added our quantifier. Another way we can check to see that this argument is valid is using Aristotelian scholastic logic. For example, you can make a checklist. You can say there are certain rules of, of quality and quantity and distribution, and you would find out that this argument meets all the requirements of a valid argument. But that's a whole nother story, a whole nother way to look at things. In any case, it's a good argument. Let's get to the second example. 
Example 2, notice that the conclusion has an existential quantifier. When considering the second premise, which has an existential quantifier as well, we can only instantiate a constant-free variable like a. Moreover, when we instantiate premise 1, which has a universal quantifier, obviously we will not want to instantiate a so-called reserved variable like x, y, or z, but we will instead want to instantiate a constant like a. Okay, if we instantiate a in premise 2, we're going to want to instantiate a in premise 1. This will allow us to relate the contents of premise 1 with the contents of premise 2, and eventually this will allow us to engage in existential generalization to get our conclusion. For line 3, let's work with premise 2. We'll instantiate the constant a. It's a free variable. We haven't used it previously in our proof, so we're good to go. Parentheses, sa or pa, close parentheses, and la by the existential instantiation, line 1. For line 4, we'll work on premise 1. We'll get not parentheses, la, and sa, close parentheses. This is the universal instantiation. Of, that is line 1. The last one, sorry, was line 2. All right. For line 5, we'll do De Morgan's rule on line 4. We'll get not LA or not SA by De Morgan, line 4. Notice that here we have LA. That's contradicted to not LA. Thus, I believe we should simplify eventually line 3 to get LA by itself, double negated, and then we'll have a disjunctive syllogism. For line 6, therefore we'll get LA and parentheses SA or PA by the commutative rule, line 3. For line 7, we can get LA by the simplification of line 6. For line 8, let's double negate, not not LA by double negation, line 7. Not not LA denies, not LA. Thus for line 9, we can get not SA by the disjunctive syllogism with lines 5 and 8. In our conclusion, we want not SX and PX, so we better get this PA from line 3. So for line 10, we can get SA or PA by the simplification of line 3. Not SA is contradictive or denies SA. Thus, for line 11, we can get PA by the disjunctive syllogism with lines 9 and 10. We have PA now. We can combine for line 12, PA and not SA by the conjunctive rule with lines 9 and 11. There is an A out there. That's a P and a not S. Line 13, therefore, there exists some X such that X is a P and X is not an S by existential generalization, line 12. For the most part, the arguments look far more complicated than they actually are. When you get into the proofs, they're pretty straightforward for the most part. You just have to keep in mind all those rules that you find in propositional logic. With example three, notice the conclusion has an existential quantifier. Let's start with the instantiation of premise 1. For line 4, we can get PA and WA by the existential instantiation, line 1. Next, we can get PA arrow BA by the universal instantiation of line 2. And now we can get BA arrow MA by the universal instantiation of line 3. We can work on line 4 to get PA. So for 7, let's get PA by the simplification of line 4. Now we can do modus ponens. So for 8, we can get BA by modus ponens, lines 5 and 7. Since we have BA, we can get MA for by another modus ponens inference. For line 9, we'll get MA. A by modus ponens, lines 6 and 8. Notice we want to get the conclusion 
Wx and Mx. We have Ma. Wa appears in line 4. For line 10, we can get Wa and Pa by the commutative rule from line 4. For 11, we can simplify to get Wa. Simplification, line 10. And now for 12, let's just combine. We can get WA and MA by the conjunction rule, lines 11 and 9. And so for 13, it therefore does follow that there exists some X such that W is an X and M is an X by universal generalization, line 12. Example 4's conclusion is a conjunction. We have there exists an x such that x is a w, and there exists an x such that x is a j. We can do some instantiation. Thus, for line 3, we can say that ja and na follows by the existential instantiation of line 2. For 4, we can say parentheses na or ha, close parentheses arrow wa by the universal instantiation of line 1. Notice that Na appears in line 3. If we can get that by itself and then put it in a disjunctive relation with Ha, we can do a modus ponens inference to derive Wa. And for line 5, we'll say Na and Ja by the commutative rule. Line 3, 6. Now we'll say Na by itself by the simplification of 5. For 7, we'll say Na or Ha by the law of addition. Line 6, and now for 8, we can therefore say that WA does follow by modus ponens, lines 4 and 7. For 9, there exists an X such that X is a W by the existential generalization, line 8. For 10, we want that JA, which appears in line 3, hence we'll just say JA by the simplification of line 3, 11. Thus, there exists an x, some x, such that x is a j by the existential generalization, line 10. And finally, we'll just combine. Therefore, there exists an x such that x is a w, and there exists an x such that x is a j by the conjunctive rule, lines 9 and 11. Up next in our lessons in first order predicate logic is the change of quantifier rule. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you soon.